that, you know, it was a horrible double take, and then a realization that actually we've got a fifth victim there, and, and, and that was a, you know, a real spine chilling moment. Victim number five was identified as 29 year old Annette Nichols. A police press conference later revealed another ghastly twist in this tale. At 3.48 p.m., a crew member on board the helicopter spotted what appeared to be a second body a few hundred yards away from the site of the first body. As you will understand, we don't have a great deal of information. As the Chief Constable has just indicated, this is breaking news and we're giving it to you as we get it. In less than a fortnight, the police had now discovered five bodies. Gemma Adams, Tanya Nicholl, Annalee Alderton, Paula Clonell and Annette Nichols. All prostitutes, all working the same few streets. It just took the whole community, I think it took the world by surprise. I don't think anybody expected it. Five bodies in 10 days in similar circumstances, you know, what was happening here. And I, I think that's what captivated um, the imagination of uh, not just the local community, but, but the world. I'm not walking in the places that I'd usually walk in. Um, I know the village quite well, and <laughs> it's really quite shocking. I think we're all, you know, in deep, deep shock, really, the way we all feel. I feel sick. I woke up with a headache this morning, to be honest. It's awful. Ipswich is quite a small, insular community really and um, I think there are a lot of people in the town who had some kind of connection to the girls that were going missing or had been killed um, whether it be through a friend or through a relative it was a it was a pretty frightening time to be in the town so frightening it even began to affect the town's commercial life for many the simple daily routine of traveling to and from work had become a nightmare the effect on everybody, but the, but the female staff in particular, was massive. And we work shifts here, so lots of girls have to walk home in the dark or walk to the bus in the dark or walk to their car in the dark. And a lot of their cars are parked not very far from where um, these unfortunate girls operated. So they were scared. In the midst of the frenzy, a national newspaper offered a quarter of a million pounds reward for information leading to the killer but the story was making headlines far beyond Britain. We had the world's media camped out on the, the front lawn here at police headquarters. I'd certainly not experienced that kind of pressure before. Um, I don't think any of us had. Um, in fact, I don't think many of our colleagues around, uh, around the country uh, have. Uh, because of the, the unique nature of these crimes, and because of the speed with which they were occurring, uh, it was just uh, you know, a unique set of circumstances. But for all the international interest, this remained a small town tragedy. On December the 16th, Ipswich came together to remember its dead. In silence, we remember the five women who've died. We remember Gemma, Annette, Paula, Tanya, and then Understandably, I suspect the community were looking in, thinking, you know, what's happening, what's happening here in our county? Um, what's taking place? Are the Suffolk Constabulary going to bring a stop to these events unfolding? Are they going to find the person or persons responsible as quickly as possible? And of course, at that particular time, I didn't have the answers to those questions. In an effort to speed progress, detectives asked the families of the victims to help them. The parents of the first victim, Tanya Nicholl, agreed to make a televised appeal for information. Tanya has been taken by someone who needs to be found. We ask for anyone who knows this person or persons to come forward and contact the police. The appeal and the relentless media coverage led to a huge amount of calls from the public. Despite the force already being overstretched, every one of them needed to be checked out. Just during that middle week of December, we, we received something like in excess of 12,000 telephone calls. I needed to reassure myself that there were no sort of golden nuggets of information amongst that volume of calls. One name that came up repeatedly during those calls was Tom Stevens. The 37-year-old supermarket worker knew many of the prostitutes operating in Ipswich and had made himself available for interviews with journalists covering the story. 
although he denied involvement in the murders, in one interview he had hinted that he could have been the killer. He was an individual who knew um, all of the girls, I think it was, um, had associated with them, had a propensity to spend an awful lot of time in the red light district. So he was of interest to us. He was just really weird and nosy and wanted to know everything about you and that. And like, I just thought it was like really creepy and everything and like give like girls a lift to go and get their stuff and everything like that. been quite engaging with the media and the police throughout throughout this period almost drawing attention to himself in custody and helping police with their inquiries the man who lived here is being held by police hunting the Suffolk serial killer detectives investigating the murder of five women in Ipswich area have today Monday the 18th of December 2006 arrested a man but if the police were to charge their suspect, they would need more than just circumstantial evidence. They ordered the forensic team to examine three of the prostitutes' bodies looking for traces of DNA from their attacker. If it matched that of Tom Stevens, they would have their serial killer. Given the seriousness of, of, of this investigation and, and the time pressure the, the police were under and ourselves, we managed to turn the, the analysis around an unprecedented time of eight hours, uh, which is pretty much unheard of in an investigation of that type. And despite our low expectation of finding anything, a, a full DNA profile was obtained. We've got a DNA profile, not of just one of the victims, but all three, and it was the same man. But the DNA did not match that of their suspect. Tom Stevens was in the clear. The killer was still at large. Despite the thousands of calls from the public and the help from police forces nationwide, detectives in Suffolk were still trying to catch up with the serial killer who had murdered five prostitutes in Ipswich. DNA recovered from the bodies of three of the victims didn't match that of their prime suspect and he'd been released without charge. But those DNA tests had given detectives a full genetic profile of the attacker. And when this was fed into the national database, they found it matched that of another man, 48-year-old Steve Wright. Steve Wright had been arrested and charged with a fairly minor offence uh, some years previously at Felixstowe. I think it was a... Uh, an offence of theft, and as is the case now with anybody that's charged with an offence, we take a DNA swab from them and um, his DNA profile was on the uh, National DNA database. So it seemed a moment of greed from Steve Wright's past had caught up with him, bringing to an end one of the most spectacular killing sprees of modern times. While the murders were happening, police had flooded Ipswich's red light district. They had no idea the man they were hunting lived at the very centre of it, number 79, London Road. We knew he was a, a regular curb crawler. He had been stopped on a couple of occasions. He had actually passed through a road check in respect of Tanya Nicholl, and he answered some uh, questions to a questionnaire that were put to him. So he was already in the system, but it would be fair to say he wasn't high on our radar. Steve Wright only moved to London Road, uh, which is in the heart of Ipswich's red light district, um, a matter of weeks before the first uh, girl, Tanya Nicholl, went missing. Uh, he moved directly into the red light district with his partner, um, Pam Wright. On the five nights that these young women were abducted and probably murdered, she was working nights, so, you know, he, he had a free reign. There was nobody at home. He could come and go as he pleased. This time it was a quiet street in Ipswich's red light district. Police arrived before dawn to make a second arrest in two days. The 48-year-old man was arrested at his home address in Ipswich at approximately 5 a.m. this morning, Tuesday, the 19th of December, 2006. He has been arrested on suspicion of murdering all five women. The people of Ipswich may have greeted the news with relief, but Wright's father, Conrad, greeted it with incomprehension. 
when the murders first come out, I was watching the television sort of regularly, and uh, they did make an arrest, and uh, I just didn't think that much more about it and thought they had the man in question. And then they decided that they'd found another man, a 48-year-old man from Ipswich, where my son I knew lived, but I didn't know exactly where, and it turned out to be him. And I couldn't believe it anyway, and I still don't. Following the arrest, detectives brought right in for questioning. But despite the weight of the evidence against him, he was in no mood to confess. We've got the last girl to go missing with your DNA and the one before with your DNA, both on their naked bodies. How can that be? No comment. With Wright refusing to cooperate, officers knew this would be no quick and easy case to wrap up. I think the public's perception is, well, that's it, you know, the police have got their man, you know, it's cracked. That's clearly not the case. Everybody's entitled to their day in court and their trial. And that's when the hard work begins for us. Police couldn't rely purely on DNA um, because Steve Wright was known to use prostitutes. Um, and it was quite clear that uh, his defence would be that, yeah, my DNA was on these women because I've slept with them, I've paid for sex with them. Um, it was therefore the police challenge to build this catalogue of evidence against him. Part of that additional evidence would concern Wright's movements on the nights the women went missing. Officers scoured 10,000 hours of CCTV in an attempt to find images of them as well as their suspected killer. Their first positive sighting was of Annette Nichols in Ipswich three days before she disappeared and captured on film, probably for the last time. We subsequently recovered a piece of footage which again was particularly poor and grainy but we believed to be Gemma during the early hours of the 14th of November but that didn't necessarily take us any further forward. Tanya Nichols' mother, Kerry, later confirmed this to be her daughter. The police now had film of four of the victims shortly before their deaths but what they really needed was proof of Steve Wright's blue Mondeo car being in those same areas on those same nights. Once again, they called on surveillance technology. Steve Wright's vehicle, or what we believe to be Steve Wright's vehicle, was seen in various parts of, of the town. Um, we were able to map all of that um, and, and also use that in conjunction with the automatic number plate reader cameras, which are situated in the town. What that actually meant was it could time and date when vehicles were being used in that location. And Steve Wright's vehicle was seen very... Um, uh, very important times on two of the nights, if you like, that um, girls went missing. Taken on the night it all began, October the 30th, this is believed to be the final image of Tanya Nickel, the first victim. Around midnight, Wright Mondeo pulls up and Tanya gets in. She was never seen again. As important as it was, and how it, you know, in the sense that it did confirm that the police were probably onto the right man, it still wasn't enough. It wasn't going to convict him. There was still a lot more work to do. Much of that work would be carried out by the forensics team. They'd found Wright's DNA on three of the victims, but could they find anything incriminating on the bodies of Tanya Nickel and Gemma Adams? These first two victims had been dumped in a river, and examining them would be difficult. Because of the environment in which Tanya and Gemma had been deposited, we felt the best opportunity that presented itself for any evidence recovery would have been their hair. When we looked at the hair samples from each of these women, we found something in the order of two kilograms of silt vegetation contamination in each. So really our first task was to try and separate that contamination out from the hair samples themselves. After several weeks of recovery process, searching and finally comparison. It's one of the most significant findings that we obtained uh, from the debris recovered from Tanya's hair was a black nylon fibre. Now these fibres are very, very typical of those that you find in the construction of carpets. And of course the first thing that came to mind was his car. With that in mind, we went to his car, obtained some samples, and we found a match between this nylon fibre in Tanya's hair with the carpet with inside his vehicle. The conclusion we drew from that was that this fibre had been transferred by a, a fairly forceful and sustained contact between Tanya's head and the car carpet. 
The DNA on the victim's bodies, the film of right with one of the victims on the night she disappeared, and this new forensic evidence meant the...